Great. Um, before I begin my talk, uh, two things. First one is they, they have my talk here in the, in the schedule, and they have this lovely blue bar next to it, which indicates that it's about VMs. And, you know, I don't, maybe just because it was me. Uh, but I think of it more as a language talk, so um, switch your brains to green uh, at this time, please. Um, the second thing is, a few of you were at this year's ASUG conference in uh, Slovenia, and this is the same talk I gave there, but this version has the new alternate surprise ending. So wait for that. Okay. So, so I, am, uh, I am Martin McClure. I am a senior engineer at uh, Gemtalk Systems. I work on the Gemstone line of products. Um, on my free time, I work on Mist, which is in a variant of Smalltalk uh, that's a personal project that does not use a virtual machine. Um, if that sounds at all interesting to you, talk to me. I love to talk about that. I've given a few talks in the past. We'll give more talks in the future, but not today. Uh, today, um, I want to talk about ephemerons. Um, is it, why is it doing that? Why is it going to the same thing that it was before? Two. More, three, ah, yes. I want to talk about ephemerons, but not yet, because first, we have to talk about um, the problem that ephemerons are supposed to solve, and that's a problem of finalization. So when we have, as we do in Smalltalk, we have um, automatic memory management through garbage collection so that you don't have to worry about freeing objects and double freeze and things like that. Um, but then there is the case where you have some kind of resource that's outside of your, of your image, like the classic example is a file handle with the operating system, and it would be nice to, to have an object in your space that, in your small talk, that represents that file uh, that is open in the operating system, and that when that uh, object is garbage collected, when you no longer need it, that it automatically closes the file to the operating system. Or perhaps even within small talk, you have, like maybe you subscribe um, to, if you have some kind of published subscribe system for sending events around, that it would be nice if the subscriber um, is no longer needed and is garbage collected that you automatically unsubscribe it. Um, so there's been several ways that this has been attempted to be done in the history of, of languages. Um, one of them is sending the message finalize to the object that is being um, that needs to be finalized, and then it cleans itself up, and uh, various people have worried at various times in the past about the fact that this allows the object, uh, while it is doing its finalization, to pass out a reference to itself, and then it's still alive, and various problems with that, and that was something that some people worried about, and some people have said that it wasn't really worth worrying about, but um, at any rate, Java did try this, it written the original Java, and this is the state machine. This is the states that um, an object must go through in order to be actually garbage collected in Java. If it does not uh, actually use, implement the finalized method, then it goes straight from here to here, and then it gets the storage reclaimed. Otherwise, it has to work its way through all of this. Um, this didn't work very well. Um, they're deprecating that in Java, and they've replaced it with some mechanisms that are somewhat more like the ones we find in Smalltalk. Um, but then there's, uh, it keeps going. Okay. I keep pushing the same button and it goes two different directions. Okay. Oh. <laughs> we interrupt this presentation to bring you this brief rant. Okay, so here's a logo. Um, my wife and I designed this logo. I came up with the text. She did the graphics. We won $1,000 for this in 1998 from the Small Talk Industry Council who wanted a logo to replace the balloon, which did not need replacing, but hey, 1000 bucks. <laughs> um, so, um, but this all objects all the time thing, I mean, that's based on this idea that... Um, it really does like to go the wrong way. It's based on this idea that everything is an object in Smalltalk. And 
This is an idea that is, I call it, it's true enough for marketing, okay? But here we are engineers mostly, so is everything in Smalltalk really an object? Well, I don't think it is. So if not everything in Smalltalk is an object, then what else is there? Anybody? I don't have any t-shirts, but. <laughs> <laughs> sure, no. Uh, the, okay, so how about messages? Um, Alan Kay has been quoted as saying that he wished he'd called it message-oriented programming because people focused on the nouns and forgot about the verbs. So, okay. Um, now, some people would say that, Bob, but there's a class called message, and you can have instances of messages, and so messages are objects. And to that, I give you this picture. Um, this is the animal that, in uh, the United States, we call a moose. Um, it has different names elsewhere, and the name moose is used elsewhere for other things. Um, for instance, in Europe, this is a moose. Uh, but we're not talking about that nice piece of, of small talk software. Um, we're talking about the, uh, the animal. Now, in, in theory, I could go out and shoot this uh, moose, and I could have it stuffed and hang it on my wall. Um, so the question is, are these two moose equal? Well, in small talk, we usually uh, consider equality based on uh, interchangeability. So if one is as good as the other, if they're equivalent, you don't care which one you get, then, then we consider them equal, otherwise we don't. So, so with, with this moose, if I wanted something to eat the vegetation on my property, this, this moose would not do very well. And if I wanted something to hang on my wall, this moose would, awkward. Okay. <laughs> so I conclude that these moose, that these are not equal. And um, so if I have an instance of, of moosage, message, um, the, the, well, okay. But I do not encourage, we talked about, you know, yesterday there was the talk about um, humane, in, in Brian's talk um, with his safari. And I also do not uh, encourage the killing and stuff, stuffing of moose. And in, uh, in small talk, we are also humane because we only kill and stuff messages uh, when they die of natural causes. And for a message, uh, death by natural, the natural cause of death for a message is to be not understood. And also, you know, some humans, especially teenage humans, might believe that they might die from not being understood. But, <laughs> but for messages, it's an actual problem. Uh, when, you, when you send a message and it is not understood, then you create an instance of message and you stuff the remains of the message into it and then you, you pass it to the, to the system and it, you know, does its thing. So we have object and messages as separate things in Smalltalk. Uh, what else do we have in Smalltalk? Well, oh, very good, <laughs> variables. You've seen this talk. No. <laughs> the, uh, so we have various kinds of variables, um, like most languages do. And anything else? Um, how about the things that variables hold? which is the object reference. So every variable holds exactly one object reference. Uh, in fact, Smalltalk can be considered a statically typed language with only one type, which is object reference. Um, you might hear analogies for an object reference um, like it's a, uh, a pointer or something, but these are kind of implementation focused analogies. If you want to think of it from a pure language semantics perspective, then you get a definition that looks, well, this is the one I like. An object reference is a channel for sending a message to an object. So, and this is, this is the only way to interact with an object, is to send it a message. And you cannot send an object a message unless you have this reference, which is your channel for sending the message. No channel, no message, no interacting with the object. 
So we've got object references, and um, that's about it from what I'm thinking of right now that's in Smalltalk. In fact, in the Smalltalk syntax, we can see that the object references are important as well as the other things. Um, the syntax only has these things in it, really. Um, I'm counting blocks as literal objects for right now. So white space is so important that they made it, the, or message sending is so important that they made white space the operator for it. You say self space size, you're sending the message size to yourself by using white space as your operator. So it operates on messages. The, the vertical bars declare variables, so they operate on variables. The assignment, colon equals, um, that takes a reference, stores it in a variable, so that operates on those two things. Uh, the literal, the return, returns a reference. And the literal objects, um, you know, they, uh, they produce an object at compile time, but at runtime they produce a reference to that object. So, and I, once again, I am, blocks are a little special. I try to understand small talk with more clarity every year, but, you know, I'm still not there on exactly everything. Um, so, we now return you to your regularly scheduled talk already in progress. So Smalltalk doesn't send finalize to the objects that it's, are being collected. It handles finalization a little differently. So with garbage collection, we have this um, contract that if an object is reachable through a chain of references from some set of roots in the system, uh, which is typically the, the stack uh, plus some object root in Smalltalk 80 and the Smalltalks that are descended from that, like Faro uh, and VisualWorks, the, uh, it's the Smalltalk system dictionary, um, that you, know, you, can, you, you need to keep all of the objects that are referenceable through the transitive closure from those roots. Um, anything else um, must be unreachable. Uh, you cannot get a reference to it. If you can't get a reference to it, you can't send a message to it. And if you can't send a message to it, it's no good to you at all. So you might as well reclaim the space. Um, so this is the basic contract. For a long time, small talks have uh, provided finalization through a modification to this contract, um, which is the weak reference. And so we have a, a weak reference implies there must be a strong reference, which is our ordinary reference, um, and it keeps the object alive. Now the weak reference is a channel to send a message to the object, but it lets the object be garbage collected. And this weak reference is usually in some kind of weak container, usually like often a weak array. So here we have a diagram that shows we have our weak array here, and it has two ref objects that it references. And I use the dotted lines for the weak references. And so we have these two objects that are referenced. And the weak array itself is referenced from somewhere up that comes, that is attached to the roots somehow. And this object is also attached to the roots somehow. But this object is not. It's only referenced through this weak array. So it can be, we think, in theory, garbage collected. And we can modify this a little bit. So now this object is being referenced strongly from this object, which is referenced strongly from the roots, so nothing can be garbage collected. But if I reverse that pointer around and put a strong reference from here to here, well, we still, this object still cannot be reached from the, from the roots, so it can be garbage collected. It's only reachable through this weak reference. Um, and we could have multiple weak arrays uh, that may reference the same or different objects. Um, in this case, there's two weak references to the object, but two weak references do not make a strong reference, so still this object is eligible to be garbage collected. But if we garbage collect the object, then what do these references refer to? If a, mess if a reference is a, is a way to send is a channel for sending a message to an object. If there's no object, then what, what does that actually mean? That makes no sense. So instead, what happens is that the virtual machine puts a tombstone, a reference to some tombstone object in there, 
Um, and the system has to guarantee that this happens simultaneously for all weak arrays that refer to the same object. Um, and uh, usually it uses a tombstone like uh, nil or small integer zero, something like that, although I think both of those are slightly poor choices and something that was actually a dedicated tombstone object in the system that had no other use would be better. Um, this avoids the resurrection problem, which is one of the ways that people, reasons that people like the weak container model is that if the system takes the object away and then tells you later that it's gone, then you, it can't be resurrected. Um, so who does the finalization if the object is gone? There's an executor object. Um, there's something of a death motif here, to tombstones, executors. The executor is the person who carries out the terms of your will. So, um, so there's a separate object, with, and it has the responsibility for doing the finalization necessary. Um, in many cases, this is the, a shallow copy of the original object itself. And this introduces some of the same problems with resurrection because maybe some of that state you didn't want to have around either, but, you know. Um, so they get um, nil or zero put in as a tombstone object, and then each of the weak container objects, in this case these two, that have had tombstones placed in them are notified sometime soon it's not very deterministic, um, that they're sent a message saying that, they, that something happened to them and that they should look. And they have to scan their contents and, uh, and see where the tombstones are. And then by the position that, was it, that it was found, they have to know who the executor is and, and send a message to the executor to get them to take care of things. Um, Okay, so VA has this thing called a weak array, but it doesn't actually meet my definition of a weak array because it doesn't let the objects be garbage collected. It does take the objects out of the weak container, it does put the tombstones in there, but then it sends a message, instead of one message per container, no matter how many tombstones have been put in the container, it sends one message per object con collected out of the container, and that contains, besides the index that it was taken from, it also contains the object itself. So the object hasn't actually been garbage collected. Um, in fact, it's a bit more like uh, an ephemeron. Remember ephemerons? It, we're talking about ephemerons. So the ephemeron, this was first introduced in Digitalk Smalltalk products many years ago, although not as many years ago as the weak array. And the ephemeron has started to appear in more um, other small talks, it's, we have an ephemeron for non-persistent objects in Gemstone. The, um, it's in VisualWorks. It's in newer versions of the Squeak and Faro VMs, I believe. Um, and the ephemeron <coughs> was, excuse me. The ephemeron was introduced to the world um, 20 years ago in this 1997 Uppsala paper by Barry Hayes, Ephemeron's a new finalization mechanism in which he described the implementation that had been used in Digitalk's products. And that was at about the time that they were moving that implementation into VisualWorks. Now, oddly enough, this paper describes the algorithm to implement Ephemeron's, but it never actually defines what they're supposed to do in any concise way. So I have attempted a couple of times now to come up with that. But the basic idea of an ephemeron is that it's a way to add, a, um, you can implement like a property dictionary with it. And this is a way to attach properties to an object that have the lifetime as though they were instance variables of the object. So, you know, so that when the object is garbage collected, then the, the properties go away as well. Um, and so, like our subscription example, our publish subscribe, you could subscribe uh, by adding a, a subscription property to the object, and then when the object is garbage collected, the property goes away. So let's take a look at how this might work. So here we have an ephemeron, and it refers to an object. Um, 
there's a lot of cases here. Some of them are complicated cases, some of them are simple cases. We're going to start with the simple ones. The first object referenced by a, an ephemeron is special. It's called the key. So, um, so in this case, the, the key object is externally referenced. It's, not, it's referenced both through the ephemeron and somewhere other way through the roots. And it's, um, so it just stays there. But if we take that reference from the, from the root, uh, you know, in the root transitive closure away, and the only way to find this object is through the ephemeron, then at this point, at some point, um, whenever the VM decides, usually when it goes to garbage collection, it, it does what I call firing. It, the ephemeron fires. And when the ephemeron fires, first thing that happens is that it becomes not an ephemeron anymore, and now it's just an ordinary object. Because all of the references in ephemerons are strong references. The, the, some of them are special, but they're still strong. They always don't keep the, uh, you know, they always keep the object from being garbage collected. So after the ephemeron fires, then once again, sometime later but soon, it sent this message mourn, usually, in most implementations, the message is mourn, more with the death motif. And once the, uh, once the object that used to be an ephemeron gets the message mourn, it, um, it then usually does whatever finalization is needed, and it can send a message to this object saying, you know, finalize yourself if that's appropriate, or it can do something else, it does whatever it wants. But it does whatever it needs, and then typically it nils out all of its fields so that then this object can, is now unreferenced and can be garbage collected. And it goes away. And you, can now, you could now put another, um, another object reference into that ephemeron, reset it to be an ephemeron again, you know, rearm it, and then it's ready to go again as an ephemeron. So you can have more than one reference in an ephemeron. The first one is the key. Any subsequent ones are called values. Um, all of my examples only have one value, but you can have any number of them. Uh, but, you know, what fits on a slide. So, so here we have our key object and we have a value object. And the key is still referenced uh, from somewhere from the system root, so we're okay. Um, now, one of the things that is often useful, and one of the reasons that ephemerons were, were made, is that, the, is that a value object can reference the key object. This is often a useful thing to do when you're making properties of that object, to have it self-referential. Or it can be, you know, not just directly, it can be indirectly through any number of other objects. So, um, so if we take away the reference the external reference to the key, and all we're left with is this, then we still want the ephemeron to fire because the only path from the root was through the ephemeron. Now, some of the paths are through the value and some of the values are through the key, but it's whether the key is externally referenced or not that makes the difference. So it fires, it becomes not an ephemeron, um, and it, you know, does the normal thing and cleans itself up and everything gets garbage collected. So here we have two ephemerons, um, similar to the two weak arrays situation. Both ephemerons will fire simultaneously in this case because there's no reference to the key object um, except through the ephemerons. And uh, they don't receive mourn simultaneously, but they receive it in the same batch of mourns, you know, from the garbage collections. And um, let's do an even more complex example. So, so this is an interesting one because it's, there's been some controversy about whether or not this one actually, um, whether ephemerons should fire in this case. So... But here we have, okay, so, so effectively, um, and my, my pointer is running out of battery, I think. So we're, um, so because we're basically attaching this object as a property of this key, then 
this object becomes you know, reachable from an instance variable of this object. So effectively, this then becomes um, reachable through this object. So in this case, generally, we don't fire any ephemerons. But now if we take that reference away, then, then we actually fire both uh, ephemerons because all of the references to these are through there. So here's, here's the moment of the surprise ending is I have attempted to make a definition of ephemeron that fits on a slide. Um, an ephemeron will fire if and only if all reference paths to its key pass through itself or through other ephemerons which will simultaneously fire. Now you will notice now at ESUG I had a different definition and I did it like an hour before my talk and I realized within an hour after my talk that it was wrong. I did this definition last night. Maybe in a day I will realize it is insufficient as well. But the thing to note about this definition, notice, is that it's recursive. Yeah. You, know, it, you know, the definition of when any ephemeron fires is based on whether all of the other ephemerons will fire. And because of this, all of the um, algorithms that you find for implementing ephemerons, including the one in the Barry Hayes paper, are for iterative fixed, uh, iterative fixed point algorithms, which uh, converge on the correct solution. Um, basically, eliminating ephemerons that definitely won't fire, and, until you, and then when you can't eliminate any more, then you know you have the actual set. Uh, but you have to do multiple iterations to do that in some cases. Um, so, in conclusion, um, why ephemerons? Um, the object can be its own executor, that's a bit of an advantage. Um, and you can add properties with the same lifetime as instance variables, even if those property objects then reference the object that you're, that you're being a property of, directly or indirectly. So that is, uh, wow. I actually got through that in like 29 minutes. Um, that was a 45 minute talk at ESUG. Uh, <laughs> it was done a little more leisurely. So, um, any questions? Thank you, Michael. I can try. <laughs> That is usually um, part of the mark sweep algorithm of the garbage collector. It's, 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 yeah, it's part of the, yeah, it's, it's, it's folded into the garbage collector algorithm because otherwise it would be, as you say, a, a great additional expense. It's a great expense anyway, but it's one that. Yes. All of the implementations I know of only do this when a full garbage collection or a fairly expensive garbage collection runs. Usually not with just a scavenge. Uh, actually, VisualWorks can do it on a scavenge, but um, anything else? All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>